Hey, everybody. So I'm going to talk about our scale out file system. It's a core piece of our disaster recovery architecture. And it's designed uniquely because backup and DR kind of combined to require a different kind of design philosophy. So I'll talk about that. So my name is Sazala. Um, I was the co-founder and the CTO for Datrium. So in my career, I've been building file systems and databases for a while, so some, uh, some skills there. Firstly, what I want to do is just show you how a typical backup and DR solution works in the cloud and some of the trade-offs you have to deal with um, typically in these kind of solutions. So the picture is showing you that on-prem, you have a bunch of workloads, VMware, VMware uh, VMs running, uh, and then you, do, you deploy some software on your on-prem so that you can then back up the data, replicate the data uh, periodically, like maybe daily or maybe every six hours, and then store, store the data into your cloud storage in some format. And then, then the question then is that, okay, if I have a disaster, what do I need to do to recover from this disaster? So you have to be able to run your workloads in the cloud. Uh, that's the kind of expectation because your on-prem data center went away. So the, the obvious ways people do this is that you copy all this data from your, uh, from your cloud storage, all the backups you have done. And depending on how you store the data, some of them just use it as a dump, the, the, the data stored in this cloud storage, just like a tape. You do full backups every once in a while and then do incremental. So if you have to do uh, kind of bring them alive, you have to kind of rehydrate and kind of you have to consolidate all, the, all those uh, different backups and incrementals together. So ultimately you will produce a stream which says, okay, here's my backup for all these 100 VMs. And then, then you have to copy all those uh, workloads and into a block storage, which is high performance. Because generally what tends to happen is that you may end up storing in a cheaper storage, which, doesn't, which can't run your workloads. So then you have to copy this into some EBS volumes in Amazon, for example, and kind of fully rehydrate them and be able to then uh, have easy to launch, easy to convert your VMs into VM, uh, from VMware into Amazon VM uh, formats and run your workloads there. So the many issues, so I'll talk, pick on the two things which are kind of important for at least a file system discussion I'm gonna show you. So one first question you have to ask yourself is, okay, in steady state, what's my cost gonna be? Because ultimately, you know, DR solutions, you know, it is a insurance business, to be honest. I mean, that's what people think about it. You don't wanna be paying more for your disaster recovery solution than you're actually a primary data center. That's nobody's gonna buy that. So the question you have to ask yourself in steady state, what's my cost? So then, if I, do I use my storage to be expensive SSD or do I choose uh, object storage to store my data? And then if I store my data in the cloud, what about AZ, you know, if my AZ goes down, if my AZ failures, do I, do I lose all, all my data? So to consider all these things into your cost factors. So if you use SSDs for storing all your data, the challenge is the expense. I mean, if you look at the price of EBS, you will, you know, you'll see that it's a shockingly like, high number, especially as, as you have more and more data and that becomes prohibitively expensive. But then, so the common option is then, okay, say, hey, I'm gonna use my object storage, it's way cheaper, I'm gonna go, go for that. But then the challenge then is that, what is your recovery time? Because you have to then copy all this data into some other uh, high performance block storage like EBS, so that takes you maybe hours or maybe days, depending how much data you have. So one customer, we did the analysis, it's gonna take 100 days to actually do this uh, kind of uh, rehydration to actually work. Uh, finish. And you can't really start your workloads until you're fully rehydrated from the into the EBS blocks. So there's a trade-off you're kind of doing between, hey, if I use SSDs, expensive ones, I can run my workloads perhaps. But if I don't do that, if I use cheaper storage, then I may end up having to then pay the price of how long does it take. From an administrator perspective, from their fear, if there is a disaster, they do care about bringing up workloads right now because everybody's watching the company's down, business is down, so that's really important. There are other issues here as well, which I think uh, Nabil may talk about a little bit, is converting VMs is a challenging problem. How do you fail back from this, you know, from another format to, uh, to the VMware format? And is it a SaaS service? Is it all like you stitched together? So there are other problems as well, but I'll focus on these two things, which are the, what is steady state cost? How do you address that? And how do you address the RTO together as one combination? So we have built this uh, scale out cloud file system to solve this particular problem. And so it's a very unique file system and it's built on cloud native abstractions. At the bottom of our file system, it's a file system. It is not a, just a dump of data on, on like object storage. It actually, loves, it actually lives there, actually runs as a SaaS service. And 
So at the bottom of our uh, story of a file system stack, so I'm showing you four things here. It's kind of a simple, a simple way of depicting uh, our file system stack. And at the bottom of it is a cloud object storage like S3. So fundamentally at the bottom layer of our file system, what we have done is that we have uh, kind of have an immutable object storage interface. It means that anything coming into our system, uh, we break it up into small pieces and you know, variable size pieces. And then we kind of have a content addressable kind of a file system. What it means is that every object in our file system ends up with a crypto hash, like a SHA-1 fingerprint. And we use that to reference all the objects all the time. And they become immutable once you do that. So you can't really change them. You can't really kind of modify them. Anything new happens to be a new object with a new handle to a new fingerprint to it. And what it does is that it simplifies the, all the layers above it. You don't have to worry about how the data is laid out. All you have, to, all you have is these fingerprints. You can just use those fingerprints to uh, build your higher layers of the file system. It's, it's important from a simplicity perspective. And it's also AZ fault tolerant. It means that if an AZ goes down, we, will, uh, we can actually fail. Uh, it's, it's easy to recover somewhere else. So the next challenge is that because you use object storage, object storage is weird. It has many interesting properties, very good properties in terms of uh, some of the bandwidth features. It's very scalable, exabyte scale if you wanted to. Uh, it's, uh, it's very durable, but it also has some limitations. The limitations are if you do a lot of small random writes to it, like let's say I have a billion objects, it'll just gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna just be too slow to do that billion, billion objects updates into the file, into the object storage. That was one issue. The second issue is that the cost of putting, doing a put and get for the objects is very expensive. So it'll add up, your cost will add up if you don't, even if you're not careful uh, on how you manage your gets and puts to these objects. So if, it's, if you put a small object versus putting a large object, you're better off putting a large object because a small object and a large object put is a kind of similar cost. So you have to be very careful uh, in how you uh, deal with these small objects. So to solve the problem, we have used built a, a distributed log structure file system. And so what it means, what is the fundamental thing about log structure file system is that we convert random writes into sequential logs. So any incoming data into our file system. So these days it's all incremental backups. There's no full backups anymore. We only do incrementals forever. That means that the data is changed randomly in random locations in the, in the VMDK and the VM. So it's kind of like happens to then show up as random updates to your, uh, to, your, uh, to your file system. So what we do is that all these random updates, we, can, we kind of put them into a sequential logs. So that's a big deal because then when you do sequential logs, you can have giant bigger blocks of data you can construct out of these small, small random writes. And then you can use the big writes into, into the object storage it's a much more better because sequential throughput of object storage is very, very high. And also then uh, you reduce the cost of this puts and gets. That is uh, how we can get down the cost of it in steady state. And it really works well, LFS, on any file system, any storage system, you know, could be object storage, could be hard drives, SSDs, everything really, really works well because no, files, no underlying media generally likes random writes, including SSDs. So LFS is a foundational, uh, element of how we actually get, get high performance from a, any object store. Especially, you know, incoming random writes, we make it into sequential writes. That's kind of what it is. And it's a distributed file system, so it's a distributed LFS. It's a deeper topic, happy to go into the details. And then the next thing we, need, we, 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 uh, we added was a snap store. It's, it's a way to keep track of our, all the snapshots coming in. So it's not like tape, it's a tape, the way uh, tape worked was that, hey, you get a full and you get incrementals and you get a full, and you get incremental. So if you wanna uh, restore, you have to gonna restore one full, apply all the patches to it and then that's how we get back. And if you delete something in between, it was weird. So we have not done it that way, but as everything is incremental, every snapshot is kind of, uh, uh, we use LSM trees. LSM trees stands for log structured merge trees. And the uh, advantage is that it works really well again on object storage. Uh, but also more than, more than that, it gives us ability to create snapshots of VMs, and millions of them, so that they're independent of each other, but yet very efficient. So you can have a million snapshots, you can delete any snapshot you want, there's no chaining problems, there's no rehydration of uh, reconsolidation of snapshots. Every snapshot looks like it's a perfect, uh, good uh, backup for that particular VM. And the other thing we get with, we get with LSM trees is that we can do instantaneously cloning, cloning clones of you know, thousands of, of VMs if you wanted to at, at any point in time. And that comes into the next picture I'm gonna show you. 
So at this point, what we have built is that these three layers at, the bo at this bottom is how to do efficient storage in steady state uh, into object storage. And that's what gives us the cost benefits of it. The next question is, how do we bring up the workloads if you're using object storage? So we have a bit of a cache on the top of all this stuff. And it's a distributed NFS uh, uh, kind of a layer a caching. There is a little bit of read caching. It's a global namespace because it's a distributed file system. So what gives us the advantage is that we have this caching layer, which we can instantaneously turn a, any, back, any backup, any point in time to be live mounted directly into the VMware SDDC. So it's first up as an NFS data store in your data, just like you, you know, data store show up in your on-prem. So we have this data store, which automatically shows up in SDDC. So the VMs can be just powered down, registered instantaneously the VMs can start running there. And it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty good performance over there. It starts running. So the thing is that as soon as you say failover, the VMs are registered and powered on, which is what you saw in the demo. And that gives the ability for the customers to then say, okay, I'm good to go. My, 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 customer, my, my, uh, my engineers, my, you know, everybody else in the company can now start working on, my, on, on their VMs and good to go. In the background, we do stuff to actually uh, slowly vMotion the workloads from our file system into the, into the, into the SDDC uh, in steady state. But that's a background job. You won't notice that thing because it's just a vMotion happening in the background. It's supposed to be kind of transparent to the end user. But the thing, I'd want, the thing we have done is that low cost and instantaneously being able to power on your workloads, that is the unique thing we have and, uh, in the industry today. And it requires a different kind of file system because, so I was the CTO of Data Domain. Data Domain is a backup company, which was bought by EMC. So it's a very, the backup is focused on how do I store data in a more compact form, cost, cost optimized form. And then you have primary storage, which is about running workloads, right? So it's the combination is what you need to make DR work in the cloud. And you need backup-like features because if you get ransomware hit by ransomware, you may have to go back in time. So you need backup copies. So you need to be very efficient at this at backups. And then you need to run workloads when there's a disaster and you have to be able to like behave like in a different way than just a backup system. So this combination of being able to low cost storage and be able to run workloads, it's a unique uh, setup. And it, that's what it takes to do a DR. If you are doing rehydration for days, that's not gonna be a, a solution customers really want. I'll stop here. I have one more slide on some uh, topic on the file system, but let me ask you any questions. Okay, cool. So there's no trade-offs we have done for our file system. The second thing we care deeply about is, you know, data integrity. Like some customer told me, uh, you know, storage systems are guilty unless they show themselves to be innocent. So you have to kind of uh, assume that you're gonna you're gonna be at fault and you need to kind of take care of it. So the reason people are using disaster recovery is because their primary data center died, and when they come to a, come to our solution like us, like they want confidence that the data is going to be good when they actually need it. So rather than them having to check periodically and bring up the workloads and see the file system is good, the data is good and verifying all that stuff. So we decided to take on the burden of doing this data integrity checks and we do it daily. So it's a little deeper topic. I have a 10 page document, but I'll just give you a brief overview on this. At the bottom, again, we have immutable objects that kind of really gives us a way to make sure that the data is not changing. Nobody can change it. And uh, that's like foundationally like an invariant other, other higher layers can depend on. And LFS also, this log, the log structure file system also provides a, a idea that you only write to new places because it's all logs. You don't write overwrite an existing uh, location. You always write to a new location. So that reduces the chance of a software bug and a corruption. And the LSM trees, uh, so this is what we do is that LSM trees are metadata. We check our entire data and metadata to be correct and they reference each other and everything looks good every day. And that's what gives you that confidence that the data is all gonna be there. And lastly, all of our snapshots are hidden. The snap stores are not visible to the end user. They're not visible directly to anybody. So there's no malicious attacks which can happen to it. And even if there was one, snapshots are immutable that you cannot really change them. You can only clone them, but you can't really change them. So these are the kind of things we have taken. We believe data integrity is our job number one. So we've taken a lot of care in making sure that we verify the data and also the other things we have done, we'll talk about later in our, not just in the file system, but in our, our orchestrator and how we 
do compliance checks and everything else. So we've done this proactive way of making sure that all the things we are keeping track of are in good shape all the time. So this combination of you know, being able to have low cost uh, file system in the cloud, which able to can run the workloads, it's kind of a unique uh, feature we have. And also this data integrity is really gives confidence for customers to be, you know, that they feel like the data is gonna be good, that you need it. So with that, um, was a quick, quick overview of, of our file system. Uh, if any question, if any questions, happy to answer. Otherwise, it's what about be... encryption of data? Is it possible uh, yes, to yes. encrypt the data? Yes, yeah. So um, yeah, I forgot to mention that. Um, so the data is encrypted all the way from the on-prem directly from there. When it comes to a file system, we encrypt it also again, and then we write it's all encrypted data returned to the object storage. Yes, good point. I should add that. Um, I have a question about where this file system is running. Is it only available on AWS? Do you host this yourself or is it on some other cloud? Today it's uh, uh, available on AWS as a service, as a SaaS service. Um, in the future, like uh, we were, Mark was saying, is that we, the intent is that we're going to be multi-cloud and it runs everywhere. But right now it does run on AWS.